Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to start the ceremony and I would like to invite our following dignitaries on the stage for the lamp lighting ceremony. Dr. Anil Handu, Director, Lab Services, BLK Max Hospital, please may I invite you, sir. Dr. Raman Manchanda, uh, Dr. Rama Manchanda, Director, Lab Services, KM Hospital, Pune. Thank you. Dr. Mamta Soni, Senior Consultant, HOD, Apollo Hospital, Chennai. Yeah, keep on clapping, it doesn't cost. Thank you. Welcome, doctor. Dr. Sita Lakshmi Subramaniam, St. John's Hospital, Bangalore. Bengaluru. Warm welcome to you, doctor. Dr. Swati Pai, Manipal Hospital, Bengaluru. Warm welcome, doctor. Warm welcome to you. Dr. D.K. Mishra, Tata Hospital, Kolkata. Thank you. And finally, from Mindray India, Deputy Director, Mr. Sudeep Mukherjee. May I invite you on the stage? All together symbolically, please. Ladies and gentlemen, may I request you to stand up, please? Shama, madam, may I invite you? Please, please, please come. A great beginning for Cube Heal 2022 here in Mumbai, presented to you by Mindray India Limited and under the auspices of BLK. Big round of applause, come on, let's do that. Thank you very much, uh, doctors, respected doctors. Thank you so much. Kindly sit down, ladies and gentlemen, as we begin the proceedings. But before that, let me tell you a little about uh, our partner, BLK Max Super Speciality Hospital, in collaboration with Mindray India, is glad to welcome you to the fifth edition of Hermitology Symposium entitled Cube Heal 2022. The theme of this hermitology extravaganza is HEAL, H-E-A-L, Hybrid Hermitology, Education, Assemble and Learning. The event is being conducted under the aegis of Academic Affairs, Research and Continuing Education wing of Dr. B. L. Kapoor Memorial Hospital, New Delhi, as an activity of professional development on science of cell analysis by hermitology analyzers conducted by the Department of Hermitology. The focus of Cube Heal 2022 is on looking at the plethora of information available on new cell counters in terms of numerical data, research data, trend analysis, graphical patterns, etc., and the overall clinical application. Ladies and gentlemen, and my dear doctors, it gives me immense pleasure to kindly welcome Dr. Anil Handu to please give us a welcome address. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome address. That's what my job is right now. And I sincerely welcome you all to this edition of CUBE. It's interesting and heartening to actually see all of you here. We've been uh, doing CUBE previously for the last two years uh, in a digital mode. Thanks to Mindray for supporting it even at that moment of time. And we are glad that we are here again today, all of us, in person. And hopefully, in future, we will not face such a challenge again. And we sincerely hope that this will be a great event, just like the way in the past. There's a fifth edition of Cube today. And I hope the way we have actually pushed ourselves and tried to create a 
scientific event which is going to give some good information to all of us. We also have a nice program lined up for the end of the day. And of course, something coming up in the morning tomorrow, which I'm sure my other colleagues will be informing you about. And we look forward to having a great event and a great gathering amongst all of you and great, uh, you know, kind of one homie amongst all of us. Thank you very much for making it here, and we hope we'll have a great time together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anil Handu. And now, may I invite from Mind Ray India Limited, Mr. Sudeep Mukherjee, Deputy Director, to talk to us. Thank you. Good afternoon, doctors, all participants, and the entire healthcare industry. At the outset, on behalf of Mindra India, I take the honor to extend my sincere gratitude to all for your presence here today to bless this occasion. A very warm welcome to all of you. I take this opportunity to salute the entire medical fraternity for their perseverance, hard work, and the attitude towards saving the life of the people. <clears throat> Mindray has completed its 30 successful years of journey, and we are moving ahead with our slogan, Together, Stronger, and Further. Mindra is now one of the global leader in the providing medical devices and solutions. We have our presence in over 190 countries with 300 plus more products. Mindra is always committed in providing advanced technologies and solutions and then transfer them into innovation and then making it accessible to the larger part of the world. Mindray started its Indian operations in 2007, and over the 15 years, we have excelled as a market leader and established our presence as medical devices manufactured and served the healthcare industry. We are not known, only known as manufacturers and marketeers, we are also very well known in the industry in imparting knowledge for the fraternity through various seminars, CMEs, and scientific events. One of them is CUBE, that is cytomorphometry, unveiling blood evaluation, which is a true academic scientific event wherein omniscient pathologists from all over the nation and from the world they participate to enlighten us with their knowledge. This is a blockbuster mega event for us in the hematology, which was started in 2018. And Mindra India feels too proud to host this along with BLK Max Group every year. This is the fifth consecutive year that we are hosting this event, and I convey my sincere gratitude to BLK Max Group, and especially Dr. Anil Handu, under whose guidance and leadership this whole event is being organized. Thank you, Dr. Sir. During these two days mega event, various cases in hematologies are going to be discussed to aid everybody in the utility of clinical and noble parameters with the profound knowledge of all the eminent speakers here. I sincerely urge everyone to hold back for these two days for this special scientific feast and gain as much as knowledge which will, which will further help you in day-to-day -day practice. With these few words of mine, I take this honor to commence Cube Heal 2022 and once again extend a very warm welcome to the delegates and guests present in this platform. Welcome all. Thank you so much. Over to 
Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sudeep Mukherjee, Deputy Director, Mindre India. Thank you, sir. We are now having something very special, and for, the, for that, I want to invite some special people, because we are having the unveiling and the launch. So may I invite Dr. Sudeep Roy on the stage, please? Dr. Ajay Shah, Dr. Shainas Kodaiji, Dr. Pradeep uh, Suri, Dr. Shabnam Ruhi, Dr. P. G. Subramaniam, Dr. Anil Hanju. May I invite all of you on the stage? And we also like to specially thank and uh, recognize and invite Dr. Sukesh Nair, CMC, with his blessings on this event from Velour. Give me a big round of applause, Dr. Sukesh Nair. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your blessings. We are so honored to have you here, sir. Please come. You'll have to stand behind that. All of you are here? Lights. Thank you. Anybody else? We have missed out. Uh, Nikhil? I had seven names, so shall I call them again? And Dr. Sudeep Roy, are you here? No. Dr. Ajay Shah? OK, thank you. Dr. Shainaz Kodaiji? Dr. Pradeep? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shabnam Ruhi? Thank you. Dr. P. G. Subramaniam? And of course, Dr. Anil Hindu is here. So my dear friends, we are now going to launch something very special. And as I, at the count of four, I want all our doctors to do what I say. One, two, three, four. Let's go because this is going to be the launch of Cube Heal 2022. I want all of you to just lift one by one and give it to me. Come on, big round of applause. Where are you going? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Come on, I want you to clap. All of you to clap. Wonderful. God bless all of you. God bless Mind Ray. God bless PLK Max for this great, great opening today at Cube Hill 2022. Come on, clap more and more. Wow. Super. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Big round of applause to our Thank you for your presence. You like that one? I can't hear you. Okay, oh, thank you. And uh, Dr. Handu, don't go away because I want you here because we're having another small launch of a wonderful machine as I count one, two, three, four. Let's go with the music and the lights. You don't know how yeah, you can just gently pull it out. And uh, here oh, Beautiful, this new lovely machine. And who's going to tell us about this? BC760 and BC780, is that the one? Yeah, Shama, come on, bail me out. Thank you, thank you, Shama. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you, respected Dr. Handu, for your presence and launching. And thank you. Thank you very much. We are now going to start with our business sessions. 
Okay, I now invite uh, Dr. Dhruv Mamthora, Head of the Department Laboratory and Infection Control, by Jibai Wadia Hospital for Children, to kindly come and address us. And the topic is Journey Towards Laboratory Excellence Experience Sharing from one of the largest public charitable organizations, Laboratory. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear doctors, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mantura with a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Not to worry. I'm okay. So thank you so much for making me the chair for all the sessions. You'll have to bear with me. I invite Dr. Dhruv, who is currently the head of laboratory and specially in charge of the hospital control, infection control, quality, and accreditation. He is the coordinator in the Wadia Children's Hospital in Mumbai. We invite Dr. Dhruv. Mandora. So good afternoon everybody. I think my topic is about the laboratory excellence journey. So we are the one of the largest public charitable uh, hospital in the country and we are a, almost a century old, uh, old organization. And this is about our journey of the laboratory excellence. How we, uh, last year we underwent the Malcolm Baldridge uh, excellence framework and we are the already award winner for that uh, excellence so that's how I come here on the stage to present our uh, journey so can I have the presentation loaded on yeah the they're, getting, they're, they're getting it doctor thank yeah. you So it's basically, uh, Malcolm Baldrige is used in most of the industries for their excellence performance and this is what how we applied it to the laboratory services which is one of the important part of the hospital and how we are just uh, trying to get along and implement the same for the laboratory. Next slide, previous slide. I think this okay. Yeah, so here is our organization, which is almost a century old, started in 1926. I think it's not working. Mm, it's it's going. Yeah, yeah. So this is our hospital. Uh, this is about the today's topic. So yes, so it was started in 1928, and. Uh, if we tell the journey, like in 2002, we have merged uh, both the hospitals, that is maternity as well as the pediatric hospital. And in 2010, we started the automation for the laboratory. In 2017, we started the re renovation and we re relocated the pediatric hospital. And that's where we uh, started the most advanced laboratory with full automation brought in the lab. Then. During the pandemic, in a uh, very short duration of time of two months, we started our COVID lab, that is the PCR lab, which is now currently undergone the uh, NABL re-accreditation. And again, like in 2021, we had phased out and uh, started our phase two expansion of the laboratory. And uh, now, at this year, we started our sequencing lab, that is the most advanced lab attached to our hospital. So as we all go through this uh, Malcolm Baldrige framework, which works on the vision, mission, and values. So where we are heading towards is what is our ultimate vision. Mission is how we are going to achieve our vision. Then the core values, which are like the guiding principles, which will help us to reach where we are supposed to reach the so quality is one of our priority and the patients are our most important priority as well as excellence is integrated in our framework and this is our policy so we have to give the most accurate and reliable results complying with the best quality standards at uh, affordable rates you know that is quality with the affordability is our main basic principle i think which we are catering in since years and then how we are going to achieve. So we made the strategic goals for that, that uh, divided into two parts, short term and long term. Then obviously 
when we are doing something on a public charitable hospital which are ever since ages there are going to be challenges so first challenges were like the logistic issues because of the pandemic secondly uh, we are a heritage class 2b structure so any modification or renovation is very difficult to do in the hospital then also like third important challenge was upgrading our information system to the latest available information systems which are available in the market and then lastly whatever challenges posed by the pandemic related to the material availability manpower availability and uh, additionally uh, like a lot of breakdowns which happened during the pandemic and also ever changing guidelines so this were our challenges so what strategies we adopted so one was like we kept on adding the scope of the services to match whatever the services which are offered by our both the hospitals then we are using directory of services as a guiding principle for teaching our doctors which are present in the hospital then implementation of the sops and ensuring that they everybody complies to this sops then training and development i think it is one of the most critical success factor which we have to focus ensuring the best price uh, for the quality of the supplies which we get and the equipment which we procure and ensuring the minimal downtime for the equipment so this is our organogram uh, how we these are our departments and the departmental assets so this will define uh, what all advanced equipments which we have and the future expansion plans of the departments these are our the scope of the services which we are offering so currently around 200 tests are already enabled accredited and we are slowly adding the scope to add this uh, test which are not in, under nabl scope and these are our key processes the process owners and the uh, stakeholders for all the processes and another process is academics because we are an academic organization so we have to support the re ongoing research projects of the hospital as well as to start new research in the department and mentor the apprentices from other government organizations so what approach we deployed was one is a quality assurance and quality control for the laboratory that is our most important approach which we deployed second training and development so we follow the uh training in a very stringent way and uh, this is how we started our journey towards accreditation and the excellence since year 19 uh, 2018 and to this current stage of laboratory these are the tools which we are using to capture the various data like the quality indicators then the incident reporting and uh reporting of the needle stick injury then the kappa analysis and the ncs we use the registers and what are the results so we have got these are the results of the 2021 so you can see that as per the international guidelines we are complying to most of the areas of the lab except some of the areas where we have the manual work like the microbiology and the histopathology the training and development we could uh, train lot of people more around 2022 staff we are training each year uh, for the laboratory these are some of the training sessions which we have been conducting in the organizations then what are the results excellence results of the excellence so if you see last 5 years performance we have been uh, adding lot of new services additionally we are uh, able to many of the areas we have already crossed our targets and this is how we are able to achieve our results so this is how this excellence framework works to bring out the results in the in spite of being a pandemic for last 2 years we are still able to maintain our performance and able to sustain the uh, laboratory what are the achievements so one was nabl accreditation i think for any public hospital to get nabl is like a big achievement and uh, we have almost started lot of new test in the phase 2 expansion so we are we have already started doing the drug levels we are already doing advanced hormonal testing we have already started doing uh, like genome sequencing and mlpa based test and even the molecular expansion we have already 
started and phase two uh, test we are going to begin in this next coming month. So this is how our achievements are. So I thank you for inviting me as a speaker. So this is our journey. Yeah. Okay. She is the consultant pathologist from Dr. Kunal Segal's lab. Very good afternoon to all of you. At the outset, I would like to thank Mindre and Dr. Kunal Segal for giving me this opportunity to perform on this platform. So, so I'll be talking about the performance assessment of ESR and immature platelet fraction for Mindre BC 720 series analyzer. So before I start, few disclaimers. This study was co-designed by Mindre and Seigel Path Lab and was funded and supported by Mindre. The aims of the study are performance assessment of ESR and IPF on Mindre BC 720 series, comparison of ESR on Mindre BC 720 with Vestagrain method, and comparison of IPF on Mindre with IPF on Sysmic series. So as we know that ESR is one of the most commonly advised and useful screening method and the, the traditional method like Western Grain method, it takes around one hour. So Mindre has come up with new technology in which the high speed cyclic flow allows RBCs to disintegrate to a monodispersed state and then there is a procedure by which the rigidity of the, uh, the tubes allow these monodispersed cells to suddenly stop the mono disintegr uh, disintegration and then at constant speed the, all the RBCs will start to re-aggregate and that time is measured at the constant temperature. So in this, uh, for uh, sedimentation of ESR, aggregation speed as well as degree is important and in this by photometric method both degree and speed of aggregation is measured and it increases the ESR determination by almost 90 seconds it takes to process both CBC and ESR. Material method for the study, the sample type used was leftover EDTA sample, whole blood samples, instruments were Mindroy BC720, Western Green Tube and Sysmix XN. Calibration was done for the Mindroy BC720, daily QC was run for both the instruments carryover study was performed, precision studies for repeatability of the patient sample and reproducibility of the quality control was done and comparison studies which would be discussed later. So for carryover study, high target values were taken which had the ESR of more than 80 and uh, low target value samples with ESR between 0 to 5 were taken. And then the study, the, they were run in the pair. High target values were run three consecutive times, followed immediately by the low target values. And then the carryover contamination rate was determined using the following formula. And the expected range is supposed to be uh, less than one. As we can see from this, the sample tested were well within the expected criteria of requirement of less than one person. Next, the precision and repeatability of the patient sample was done. The ESR sample were collected of the following range and which were according to the different ranges of ESR, the different level was done. And then the, the samples of above ranges were tested for 10 consecutive times. And the repeatability test was uh, then done, the mean standard deviation and the coefficient of variation was calculated. As we can see, the acceptance criteria the acceptance criteria for the ESR of the normal range 0 to 15 was less than 1.3 standard deviation while for more than 15 was less than 9 person. As we can see from this data, the lower level 1 and level 2, the SD is well within the reference and for the ESR of higher levels, the CV is less than 9 person. Uh, similarly, the repeatability for the patient sample was done for IPF in which the level, different levels of low, high and normal level samples were taken. The acceptance criteria for CV was less than 25% and this was, in our study, it was well within the range. Uh, 
Then the reproducibility for the quality control sample was also done. In this, the BCQD quality control was tested in ESR mode. And also, this was done three consecutive times. And after an interval of 5 to 12 hours, again the same QC can sample was tested for three times, for, three, for five consecutive days. And as we can see, the CV was between 0 0.90 to 1.43 for ESR. And for IPF, it was between 3.1 to 6.8, which is a good CVN. So the comparison was, uh, comparative study was done for 332 blood samples across the different ranges and clinical conditions on BC 720 and compared with manual Westergren method. And a total of 184 samples were run for comparison of IPF with the SysMix machine. So uh, for the comparison, first the passing by block analysis for, uh, was done. The total samples of 132 were taken uh, from the reference range of minimum of 1 to the maximum of 135. And for the similar ranges were obtained on BC 700 also. The coefficient correlation was found to be 0 0.94, which is uh, supposed to be good more, as it was more than 0.9 as the recommended criteria. Also, the bland Altman analysis was done to establish the, uh, the arrangement between the Wester Green and the, which is the Grohl standard, and the difference between the uh, Minray and the uh, Wester Green method. As we can see, the mean difference was uh, came to be 2.6. This, this was calculated for the absolute value for the normal samples. We did, it was divided into two parts. One was for the normal ESR, in which the absolute values were calculated, and next was for the higher ESR values, for which the percentage values were calculated. As we can see, the mean difference in this was minus 3.56, which is mild underreporting was there in Mindray, and the SD was 28.9%. Also, the IPF was comparison was done with passing by block analysis, in which the min sample collected was a number samples were 184, with minimum ranging for 0 0.72, to maximum 33 reference, and the similar reference was also obtained on BC 720. The coefficient of correlation was 0.868, which is within the required criteria, meets more than 0 0.8. Also, the bland Altman analysis was done for the same. And we found that the mean difference was minus 0.78, and OSD was 2.63. The conclusion from the study was the performance assessment criteria for the carryover studies, precision, repeatability, and reproducibility are met. ESR showed a good correlation coefficient of 0.94. Blant Altman analysis for the samples within the normal ESR showed minimal deviation, while for the ESR with high value, though mean bias was insignificant, standard deviation of 28.2% was noted. IPF sample showed good coefficient of correlation of 0 0.86. Uh, however, as IPF calculation algorithms on different instruments are different, instrument-specific normal range and clinical evaluation is recommended. I would like to acknowledge Mindray team, especially Dr. Kuku for study, who is the principal, who was the principal investigator, Bhavna for sample processing, Dr. Shama and Kirik and Yang for the study coordination and statistic analysis. And from the team, Segal, I have Dr. Kunal sir, for, who is the principal investigator of the study, Dr. Manjusha and myself for sample coordinator, Pratidhya Archana and Jyotsna for sample coordination. Thank you. Thank you, Vasudha. Thank you so much. Maybe one or two questions, Shama, can we allow? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, please. Yes, please. So this one, it had 37 degrees was the temperature in the machine, inbuilt temperature. No, the West again, we will doing at 18 to the ambient. lab ambient temperature of the lab. Ambient. The machine is at 37 degrees centigrade. The machine is at 37. Thank you. Thank you, Vasudha. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Vasudha. Thank you, Dr. Rama. It's, it was a pleasure having you here. Thank you. So Thank
Now I'll invite Dr. Vinanti Golvilkar, Patankar, Laboratory Director of AG Diagnostics, Pune. She's followed her father, late Dr. Golvilkar, and completed MD Pathology from BJMC. Her special interest is in the field of hematopathology and molecular diagnostics. Also, she happens to be my friend. I invite Dr. Vinanti Golvilkar for her talk. Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings to all from AG Diagnostics Private Limited, Pune. At the outset, I would like to thank Team Mindray and the organizers of Youth Meal 2022 for giving me this opportunity. I would be covering a few case scenarios, not so uncommon in private laboratory settings, and I'm sure many of you would be able to identify with these situations. Most of the cases we encountered in private laboratory practice are like few pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, and we are always struggling to get the complete picture. One such case we encountered uh, at AG Diagnostics sometime in 2018. At that time, AG Diagnostics was a fairly new organization. This 40 years lady marched into the OPD complaining that all her reports done at our laboratory were wrong. You can imagine our dismay. I took her to my cabin, sat her down, tried to calm her down. She said that within a span of 10 days, her hemoglobin had jumped by almost two gram percent. Her iron value had dropped down from a phenomenal 304 microgram per deciliter to a deficient 22 microgram per deciliter. Her glycated hemoglobin varied by more than 0.5% and did not correlate with her blood sugar values. And she claimed that she had taken no significant treatment whatsoever. So what were we looking at? Discrepant hemoglobin, discrepant iron, discrepant GHB and blood sugar, discrepant history, or the worst nightmare of all, a discrepant sample, a sample mix-up. At the same time, I called for her reports, review of her reports, and this was the data from the hematology analyzer. So this CBC was run on the 9th of July. It showed a hemoglobin of 9.1 gram percent with a microcytic hypochromic blood picture, MCV of 66.2 and a wide RDW, RDW CV value of 24.5%. On the RBC histogram, what I saw was there was a small hump towards the end of the histogram at about 100 femtoliters, which indicated the presence of reticulocytosis. So this hematology analyzer picture was pointing towards Polychromasia, most possibly due to hematinic supplements, iron supplements, in a case of microcytic hypochromic anemia due to iron deficiency. However, on the same day, her iron studies revealed that her iron was deficient with a low iron and a raised TIBC total iron binding capacity value. The HBHPLC, which was done, on that day, revealed a normal HBHPLC pattern, and the GHB was 4.8 gram percent. She had done iron with us a few days back on 30th of June, when her iron was very high, the value was reprocessed, with also an accompanying high TIBC. So this kind of picture in iron studies is typically seen after injectable iron supplement. However, she did not give any history of any injectable iron supplements. She said she had taken oral iron for a couple of days, after which she had discontinued the same too. On reviewing literature, I came to know that iron values as this could come 
uh, after oral IM supplementation, when the uh, blood testing is done at the peak, at the time of peak absorption of IM from the GI tract. This was her previous CBC done on the 26th of June, which showed a hemoglobin value of 7.9 gram percent with a microcytic hypochromic picture, MCV of 62.8, indicating iron deficiency. The GHB on that day, the 26th of June was 5.4 gram percent. However, on the 9th of July, it had come down to 4.8% due to the presence of reticulocytes in significant number in the sample on the 9th of July. We have a system of going through the Delta check of the patients coming to us accordingly. Uh, this was what I had found from my Elias. The hemoglobin had actually gone up from 7.9 gram percent to 9.1 gram percent. Uh, again, 7.9 is closer to 8, 9.1 closer to 9. So it was more like a raise of 1 gram percent as against the impression the patient carried, 7.9 point that it had gone up by almost 2 gram percent. So when all this data was reviewed, we realized that it was none of these and everything was falling into place like this. However, an important learning from this, I tried my level best to explain to the patient. I spoke to her clinician. However, the patient didn't seem to be convinced. And yes, she has not come back to us. So however right you are technically, the patient should also be convinced. Otherwise, it would be difficult to retain a patient. My next case is again a quite common scenario in our laboratories. So this was a 60 years female who had done test in one of our hospital labs with a complaint of fever for two days. Her CBC showed a platelet count of 97,000, so basically thrombocytopenia, with the presence of polymorphonuclear leukocytosis. Both were not going hand in hand. On closely looking at the WBC histogram, I saw a small hump below, uh, before the lymphocyte peak, and the WBC scattergram did not show a clear cut differentiation amongst the various WBC populations. On smear review at low power itself, we could pick up fibrin threads in the sample and a fresh sample was requested. On receiving the fresh sample, expected the platelet count came out to be 7 lakhs 9,000. So it was in fact a case of thrombocytosis and not thrombocytopenia. Here, the WBC histogram and the scattergram showed well-differentiated WBC populations. This, word, uh, this was the peripheral blood smear findings in the same case. I would say my presentation would remain incomplete without going through a few cases of thalassemia. Uh, and what I want to highlight through these cases is the various patterns that we see on our hematology analyzers. While they can help us, they can also be deceptive. So this was a 33 years female who had come for ANC workup. Her CBC showed a hemoglobin of 10.4 gram percent with a microcytic hypochromic blood picture, RDP of 16.3, and a raised RBC count of 5.38 million. PBS confirmed the same findings. There were few target cells as well on the peripheral smear. The hemoglobin HPLC of the sample showed an A2 value of 5.2% and this was a case of heterozygous beta thalassemia. Another case, 11 months female child 
the CBT showed a hemoglobin of 5.1 gram percent with a white RDW, CV of 38%. The RBC histogram showed likewise white distribution. The WBC scattergram showed an area uh, of cluster below the lymphocytes where uh, there, were, there could be NRBCs and RBC fragments debris. The peripheral blood picture corroborated these findings with presence of marked anisocytosis, poikilocytosis, micro hypo picture with the presence of moderate polychromasia and five to six NRBCs per 100 WBCs. HBHPLC was done in this case showed hemoglobin F concentration of 93.2% and this was suggestive of homozygous beta thalassemia. And now this case, 16 years female with no history of blood transfusion. Looking at the CBC, especially the RBC histogram, a hemoglobin of 3.8 gram percent and RDW of 50 percent, wide RDW. Again, the WBC scattergram showing an area of debris below the lymphocyte bounds. And in addition, this patient also showed leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. On the peripheral smear, there was marked anisopoikilocytosis, microcytosis, hypochromia. But in addition, there was mild valocytosis and only mild polychromasia with occasional NRBCs. We did the HPHPLC in this case, and this showed. A2 concentration of 6.1%, F4.5%. This was suggesting heterozygous beta thalassemia. So looking only at the hematology analyzer histograms was suggesting a beta thalassemia major, homozygous thal. However, this was a case of heterozygous beta thalassemia with a coexistent iron and B12 deficiency. With this, I would like to end my presentation. I would like to acknowledge my team at AG Diagnostics. This is the hematology department uh, of our lab and my entire team at AG Diagnostics. Thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Vinanti. We have next Dr. Jairam Ayangar, who is online. And I would like, if Dr. Jairam Ayangar is listening to us, there was a glitch in your uh, video. So we would like to play it now, since it's uh, running properly now. So we'll, is it OK if we run it now? OK, sir is online. Thank you, sir. So uh, I would request Dr. Ajay Shah to introduce uh, Dr. Jairam Ayangar. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I will now introduce Dr. Jairam Ayangar, Managing Director, Anand Diagnostics Laboratory, and he will speak on CS80 and beyond, drivers of laboratory operational excellence. Sir, over to you. Greetings to all from Bangalore. The plan for today's talk for the next 12 to 15 minutes is to highlight on the changing perspectives and perceptions of laboratory medicine and laboratory practice and uh, touch upon uh, the concept of a laboratory value pyramid, which is something focused on customer satisfaction and what the lab needs to do for that. And before we begin, a few disclosures that source of material is from the internet as well as from the in-house data that we've generated over the years and the patient confidentiality is protected. As we are all aware, the early 20th century onwards, the medical laboratory was 
predominantly physician oriented run by physicians the results were used for by the physicians for their own needs but over the years a lot has changed in the shape and function of the diagnostic laboratory and the 21st century has actually thrown up a lot of challenges to the laboratory both of, both on the technical as well as on the operational areas a lot of challenges have come up the laboratory service has taken on the form of an industry there is an increased pressure on cost containment there is an increased demand to keep pace with the developments which are occurring very very rapidly there is an increased pressure on error reduction and increased pressure on improving the quality services there is an increased need to consolidate and automate laboratory processes increased dependence on information technology increased need for the evidence based disease management and last but not the least a major aspect is the changing expectations of the end user or the customer which has changed tremendously over the years so in essence the laboratory and the laboratory professional have moved from being a, a passive and a submissive uh, entity into a a sort of a consultant and almost like an active partner in the healthcare so with this background if you go to the baseline scenario of most of the laboratories in the current context where accreditation is quite uh, you know it's it's in vogue and good equipment good methodologies regulations with all of this most of the laboratories have achieved a certain level of competence and performance so what differentiates a good lab from the average lab or the not so very good lab i think there the value add is the differentiator the value add that the laboratory can provide above over and above the baseline quality services differentiates a good lab from the not so very good lab so in in short the service offered by the lab defines the reputation and the better the lab is at this activity of delivering good customer service in at one stage probably the lab may not have any other peer to benchmark against and the lab will need to benchmark against its own self or against its own performance looking at the lab customer footprint we have the physicians we have the patients we have the community we cannot forget the community as one of the consumers or the customers of the laboratory and also we need to pay attention to our staff and meeting the requirements and exceeding the expectations of all these customers i think matters a lot for the laboratory needless to say the the quality definition of quality as made by uh, edward deming includes customer satisfaction and among the clsi quality management system essentials 12 of them are there customer service is another important aspect so with this in our mind if we can quickly go through the concept of a laboratory value pyramid which i have taken this concept from the from the internet basically this looks at the various levels of customer satisfaction services that a laboratory can provide starting from level 1 to level 4 so let's start with level 1 quickly most of the labs are on reactive mode they identify errors they identify non conformities do root cause analysis and bring in corrective actions to ensure that the same errors do not recur but then we need to move further beyond that that proactivity the culture of prevention predicting that these are potential sources of error and then plugging them ensuring that these errors do not occur in the first place takes a lab one step higher and that would be the level 1 of the laboratory value pyramid a constant analysis of the key performance indices along with the qi or qc data that takes the lab over the path of continual improvement and 
initially the lab may need to engage external experts to help them in this process so moving up one level to the level 2 the lab not only looks at its own internal processes but will start looking for feedback from the outside feedback from the customer so the lab starts look feed, actively looking for the customer survey data and ways by which this survey data can be utilized for improvement it moves from volume mentality to uh, value mentality and there are certain benchmarks it can create for itself the lab shifts from a purely service oriented mindset to a business mindset and there is a tremendous focus on it requirements not only to improve lab processes but to integrate all this data to deliver greater value outcomes so this is what level 2 labs would be achieving we'll dwell a lot more on the level 3 labs where we have a slight shift from the internal uh, viewing or internal focus to the external focus the lab should become more proactive and drive improvements in informatics to create more value from the laboratory data and the laboratory consulting services more and more active advisory services need to be given to the customers which adds value to their management the it projects need to be supported these it projects that integrate essential lab patient information and this converts into algorithms which add value to the patient in essence the lab shifts from a from being a service provider to a partner in healthcare so let's go in detail about the clause of being proactive and driving improvements the points i'd like to make here what we have achieved over the years the last one decade or so uh, there are a few examples in this area we introduced serum protein electrophoresis as part of the extended liver package initially a lot of people were wondering why we were doing this was it necessary is it just a business gimmick but if you look at this chart here the outcome of analysis over the last decade you'll be surprised in fact to note that as much as 4% of all those so called normal individuals who got a liver function test as part of their routine screening showed up abnormalities m spikes on the serum protein electrophoresis how many of these were actually myeloma how many were uh, m gus is the next matter of investigation but to let you know in fact just last week we picked up an incidental early myeloma in a patient who had come for a routine screen without any symptoms so that definitely adds value to the customer and exceeds their c testing introduction of anti ccp along with rheumatoid factor assay ionic calcium with total calcium and so on the other thing we did was we introduced diabetic retinopathy screening as part of the diabetes screening in association in collaboration with calzeis this was introduced in 2015 and we picked up a good number about 12.6% of is apparently asymptomatic individuals were showing early signs of diabetic retinopathy so that adds a huge value to the patient outcome then the our physicians are very much tuned to picking up early variations in biochemical parameters when they come for review of their reports and one such example we picked up at least 12 cases of a primary hyperparathyroidism just based on the variations in the ionic calcium and the total calcium and reflex testing of the parathormone so this again adds tremendous value to patient care now looking at it projects to create algorithms we have one major project which is nearing finalization that is to use rbc indices to recommend whether the patient has iron deficiency or thalassemia accordingly advise them for the appropriate investigations and this actually went through a number of uh, you know iterations and various steps in their validation we use hemoglobin mch 
RBC, MCV and RDW as the predictor variables to help us predict whether the abnormal report falls into a classic iron deficiency, possible iron deficiency, classic beta thal, possible beta thal or an overlap. We built distinct modules for male and females and we built certain as criteria for inclusion into the study. The roadmap was that we knew initially made a problem statement, then started retrieving our archived data, analyzing the data, clustered them into algorithms, built in certain predictive models to look at these parameters in the routine CBC and categorize them into any of these criteria or categories. And currently we are in a situation where we are almost finalized the validation of these algorithms and we can actually launch these algorithms live into our reports. Advantage here is it brings in consistency and helps the pathologist actually bring in the advisory services to each and every hematology, abnormal hematology report. And this is how the prediction shows up on the uh, screen where the pathologist would be reviewing the reports. Various other things which the data science has contributed. We have a full-fledged data science department now, manned by four individuals full-time. And we are working on various models, including analytical modules and predictive modules. One of them is the critical alert reporting and documenting, predicting liver disease uh, using the LFT results, predicting urologic disease, using the urinalysis report, metabolic risk syndrome screening, sample TAT prediction. We are working on sample TAT prediction and critical alert reporting, kind of automating the process at this point. So these are the things which definitely go beyond customer expectations where the laboratory would be very proactive in advising not only the patient, but also the physician as to what needs to be done next what is the value of laboratory tests? How you can utilize these laboratory investigations to greater advantage of the patient? And the next step, once we've achieved this, once we've done excellent, uh, you know, in this area, we only need to benchmark ourselves and see how we can do better than what we are doing at this point of time. So this, friends, is the concept of laboratory value pyramid. And this is the step which we need to follow and go up the ladder uh, step by step to ensure that we can exceed our customer satisfaction. So I acknowledge the contributions of the data science department, Ms. Uma and uh, Datamurti, and our physician, Dr. Ajit, immense uh, you know acumen is got, and uh, he's very alert to pick up these. Uh, early abnormalities. So he's contributed a lot to exceeding our customer satisfaction. So with this, I'd like to end my talk saying that exceeding customer satisfaction or expectations is where satisfaction ends and loyalty begins. So we can increase the number of our loyal customers by bringing in small changes in the way we start looking at our laboratory data and sharing this information with our customers. So thank you very much. Thank you for the patient hearing. Hello. Thank you, sir. If there is any question, we can take up one or two questions or Okay. Sir is online, so if anybody has any queries right now, you can ask. Okay, we will go for the uh, next uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, please bear with me. Uh, next uh, speaker will be my last uh, introduction as a chairperson. Uh, I will invite Dr. Anil Handu. Uh, very well known name in the industry. He is a senior director, hospital lab services, uh, BLK Max Hospital. Of course, uh, he needs no introduction further. And without wasting time, uh, more time for this, I will invite uh, sir for the talk. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, sir, for kind introduction, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, so my talk, yes. So my talk is evolution of hematology analyzer science, and what I'm going to be, be talking about is is digital morphology the pinnacle? And why am I saying so is because that's the next thing which most of the people aspire for, the digital morphology nowadays. Okay, so there is a glitch already. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, okay, the quiz time. All right. So it's, yeah, it's retro, isn't it? So tell me, and there is a prize for this, dinner on me tonight. Which movie? Absolutely, spot on. So the dinner is on, along with the retro theme. So roti, kapda and makan is what we have all known about. And in terms of hematology also, let's look at basic needs of life. Basic needs of life, roti, kapda or makan. Basic needs for CBC, hematology analyzer, microscope, slide and a counter. Yes or no? Then why the hell am I talking about digital morphology? Yeah? So, I am talking about digital morphology because many, many, many years ago, I was given a talk where I was about, supposed to talk about cell counter data, flags, and how do we define slide review rules. And mind you, I was talking about this somewhere in, in the 2012-2013. And imagine these rules had come in 2005. So we were already about a decade later, you know, nearly. And today, we are talking about digital morphology. Today, when morpho digital morphology has been existing already for decades. So why? Because ye dil mange more. As simple as that. So we have desires, we have, you know, requirements, we have longings, we have cravings, we all want to do something new, something more. And that's where digital thing comes in. Imagine when I was a kid and I would watch sci-fi and I would look at somebody else, you know, on the television, the, the one with the long ears, I'm forgetting his name. Yes, absolutely, spot on once again. So the guy would, you know, look at the screen on front and would talk to somebody and we would think, oh my God, video calling, this is something which is, you know, not possible. But is it possible today? Is it possible today? We just saw it, no? We were talking to Dr. Jairam. Yeah. So really, things are moving on, right? We are all wanting to digitize. We are all wanting to move on. And if you remember, Rajani Kant, favorite of Dr. Sukesh, this is the movie, Robo 3. Of course, he was showing us so many things in this movie, but we are talking here about digital morphology. So when we talk about complete blood count today, it's a routine test, we know that. Almost about 30 to 40% of tests in any laboratory is a CBC. And in a hematology laboratory, it will not be an exaggeration to say maybe 50% of our tests are complete blood counts in hematology. And what do we do? We screen, and the moment the number of samples go up, what's our worry? We are wanting to look at the peripheral blood film, right? And that's what, in fact, there is a lecture about this which says, PBF is a window to the human body. May not be an exaggeration, because a lot of times you are able to actually pick up a lot of stuff in peripheral blood, which people are actually oblivious to. So, I'll start with white blood cells. Now, why white blood cells? White blood cells are like W for white and W for woman, and they are glamorous. The most glamorous cells, cells in hematology are the WBCs, right? And we, they are most varied as well, just like any other woman. Extremely varied. So you need to figure out which WBC are you dealing with, right? And every time when you see a WBC, the variability amongst all of us is huge, right? Have you ever tried to see monocytes and myelocytes? 
right? There are times when you classify one to the other, especially when they have some granulations here and there. So therefore, when you look at WBCs, this is one area where perhaps digitization would make it very, very good. Now we know that cell counter, we've been always professing about cell counter all these years. We've been saying, let's get a cell counter and cell counter will do our morphology. We talked about hemocytomorphometry. So what are we now trying to do? We are now trying to go back, the retro part of it, going back to morphology. And therefore, that's where the whole picture comes into the being. Now, what is your wo usual workflow for CBCs? You get a sample of blood, you push it into the analyzer, you get a printout out of that, you analyze either manually within your technical staff or you have an algorithm based in your middleware and you define whether you'll make a smear or not make a smear. Yes? Yes or no? Yes. So we all do the same. And then eventually we review a smear, but that review has to be done by us. Majority of the pathologists will do it on the microscope, and then we will authenticate the report. So look at this. What do you have on the left-hand side here? The scatters, the histograms, and most importantly, the morphology. So morphology has not really moved on. Morphology has to be there. It is a part and parcel of our life. Now, I was, as I was trying to prepare for this talk, I went through this very interesting article where it says, if I don't do morphology, it's blasphemy, right? And it says, and the Oscar goes to the peripheral blood film, right? So the Oscar still goes to the peripheral blood film, and therefore we need to have the blood film, which is nice, beautiful, having all its colors in the right proportions, and which can be accessed even when the slide has been discarded. So this is where the entire picture has come about. There's a lot of discussion about it, which ISLH has also been doing, ICSH has also been doing. And they, of course, have given us the slide review criteria to make the slides, to reduce the burden for us. And they've also started talking about how digital morphology is to be taken care of. How do you validate it? And how do you take about going ahead with the digital morphology today? So why did you have a cell counter at the first instance? Your aim was to reduce your manual labor and to reduce the work of reviewing the smears. Yes, but at the same time, you're also worried about missing your cases. There are cases wherein everything seemed to be normal and yet you had a small little parasite over there, right? Now what if I tell you that post flagging and if you want to see a smear, we go on to from the manual microscopy that we were doing previously where we were looking at the microscope, getting a slide made, looking at the blood film, getting these pictures into, the, in our, into our mind and eventually reporting it out to something which is all digitized you know, which is all going on to a digital platform. And why am I professing for it so much? Since last two and a half years, we've seen reaching the laboratory at times became a big challenge. And you would want to see a digital picture and give out the information. So this is the current workflow in any laboratory. You have a sample coming in. You are actually, you know, getting your analyzer to work on it, getting the results, making a smear. The technical staff will review it. It'll reach you and eventually you'll report and sometimes you might want an expert opinion. To get the whole thing done, if I immediately put it onto an automated platform and get the whole thing done, my manual smear, the limitations with the manual smear review will go down markedly. And that's where it becomes useful for us. I'll not get into details of why digitization because I've already explained the whole concept to you. And next comes the concept of artificial intelligence which is what something Dr. Poonam showed us in one of our present, in the presentation, wherein artificial intelligence is actually having what is called deep machine learning, identifies cells on a regular basis. Dr. Mishra was talking about, you know, having that bucket where the cells were not identified and eventually trying to identify those cells subsequently as well. Yes, when you go into artificial intelligence mechanism, this whole concept keeps on evolving and eventually you're able to get and differentiate between various cells. So this is a methodology which is used by Sigtuple. There's also the methodology used by Cellavision, which I have had the opportunity of working on both the machines in my center. And in all of them, eventually you get to see your images appropriately. It eventually actually segregates the cells into various subtypes. And through the system of artificial intelligence is able to actually pinpoint 
few differential diagnoses, sometimes actual diagnosis. There was a question about bone marrow. Is it possible to review a bone marrow? So this is an article which I have, you know, pulled out from the internet, wherein they are looking at bone marrow morphology through the help of digital imaging and eventually artificial intelligence and actually classifying the disease, wherein they were looking at morphology of megakaryocytes and looking at myeloproliferative neoplasms and telling you that, yes, indeed, it could be an MPN. This is a study where, again, they have looked at, using the artificial intelligence, how they have clubbed diseases into various subgroups within the MPN group also and even other leukemias. So is it possible to do this on a, on a digital platform? In fact, it is only possible to do it on a digital platform. Because if you try to do it manually, you will take many, many man hours. And that's why artificial intelligence and uh, digital platform is here to stay. So when we talk about digital morphology and setup and its implications, a few things which we need to remember, we have to have how do we select, what do we put on digital morphology. You can't have, you have 400 samples in a lab, all 400 cannot go on to a digital morphology. So you'll have to be very selective. Which ones do you choose? Do you want a whole mount image or do you want selected areas to be you know, looked at? Currently, if you look at majority of the digital platforms for hematology, they're not looking at the entire whole slide image. They're looking at selected areas which are put across to you. Of course, trading, validation, and optimization is what needs to be done. But what is important at the end of the day, you're able to get clinical correlation or not. So the algorithms need to be defined. The inter-variability between the pathologists needs to be looked at. And most importantly, what you see in this picture on the right-hand side is the possibility of going across and getting second opinions. And that's what makes it very useful and beneficial. Just showing you a few quick case studies. These are a few from Sigtuple, a few from, uh, from the Cellavision, and some of them from the Mindray one, which we now have our, at our place. The one which Poonam showed you previously. This one is from Cellavision. Look at the clarity of images. Beautiful, you'll actually be able to pick up cases, uh, you know, from remote access also. A chronic lymphoproliferative disease, plasma cell leukemia. Mind you, all these cells were actually very few in the entire smear, but they were picked up individually and that's why you were able to pick them as a diagnosis. Look at the RBCs. We did see some of the presentations previously where microcytosis, poikilocytosis, etc. can be a challenge. However, the same thing when you see from a digital morphology imaging platform, all this can be picked up very easily and beautifully. Again, this is from Cellavision, Rule Formation. Sickle cell disease, if you look at this picture, you may not be able to pick it out directly, but when you look at it from a near vision, you will be able to get your sickle cells, and they'll be picked up by the software on its own. Again, malaria, somebody was asking about whether you can pick up uh, you know, infections. Yes, you can. So there are a lot of things which can be done potentially. Of course, the toxic granulations, the dole bodies. We saw all that in some of the presentations previously. Hairy cell, discranulopoiesis, myeloblasts, dysplastic erythroid precursors, platelet and isochromia, something which most of us don't even bother looking at in a usual case. Again, satellitism, so one of the most beautiful pictures that you see. We have recently uh, had the opportunity of looking at this. It's still in the process of actually getting installed and hopefully we will share something with you in near future. I believe they are claiming that they have a much better clarity and I would like to work on it and see and give you possibly the information in my next cube. And uh, the advantage which they have suggested is that there is a possibility of looking at platelets all along the entire breadth and the spread of the uh, slide. So, uh, just to leave you all with the images to enjoy, and of course the tea which is waiting outside. These are the images from blasts, some normal lymphocytes, some other cells like the neutrophils and the eosinophils, etc. Myelocytes, and of course the faggot cell which you can see at the top, such beautiful images which eventually come out of this, these analyzers. So the take home, it helps you to standardize your system uh, you know, you're able to automate, you're able to transmit images across to people, you're able to get second opinions on the data which is coming out from there. 
And of course, you can have what is called the electronic health records as well as improved turnaround times. I wish I would have had this digital platform earlier in my center because I wanted to look at a marrow today and I could have seen it here while delivering a talk here itself. Nevertheless, next time, for sure. And the final take homes, it is only as good as you give it to be. So if you don't have a good slide, we saw that in one of our experiments in our lab, wherein the slide quality itself really mattered. It started picking up certain globules within the glass as something which was abnormal. And later on, we realized that we needed to change our slides. So it helped us in that as well. So we have to get good quality slides, stain it correctly, take an appropriate image, and only then are we able to classify and give the right information across for the patients. What is most important is, by this I'm not trying to tell you that none of us is required. I think most of us are still required and will always be required, and it's the man behind the machine which actually is important to ensure that whatever the computerized algorithms come up, they are taken care of, you know? While it may be important for us to realize when we go into a plane, a lot of times the pilot is actually just sipping coffee and doing nothing and putting the aeroplane in an autopilot mode. But just imagine if he's not there, you wouldn't take off, and if he's not there, you wouldn't land appropriately. So important point, man behind the machine is still very important, and hopefully we all will digitize someday, and maybe we'll all share more digital images in the next cube. Thank you very much. Looking forward to any questions, and we can, after that, break for tea as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, taking us the journey of uh, digital morphology and uh, artificial intelligence. So if there is any questions, uh, we can have, otherwise we'll... If you can see the camera, the camera can see you. Remember that. So ensure that you look at the camera. Superb. Okay. Now, do some different emotions. Okay, look here. Are you ready? Everybody, when I say one, two, three, I want you to give me a yeah. One, two, three. Wow, that's a good year. Everybody, when I say one, two, three, right hand up, dancing. One, two, three. Everybody, when I say one, two, three, right hand, keep it up, and left hand, both the hands. Great. Now, everybody, when I say one, two, three, samne wale ko laat maro. One, two, three. <laughs> Superb. Okay. Everybody, when I say one, two, three, especially the guys and girls who are standing, jump. One, two, three, jump. Superb. Super. Very good. Everybody, look at your partner and say, hey, hey, hey. Superb. Everybody say, I love Mind Ray. I love BLK. Only ladies say, I love Romy. <laughs> okay. Give yourselves a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, my dear doctors, my dear friends. Love you all. Thank you. Stay there only. We are having the, the meetings here, the sessions here. The audience is there and for the next two hours. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. You may disperse. You are so cooperative. Very good. Organize the next three minutes. I'm going to give three of you prizes. All you got to do is pay attention. Will you do that? You don't want the prizes? You don't want the prizes. Okay, thank you. Take them back. You really don't want the prizes. Okay, here we go. Spot prize. Listen very carefully. What is unique? How many of you were at Cube 2019? Many of you. How many of you remember seeing me at Cube 2019? One, two, three. The cameraman is remember seeing me. Four, five. Okay. How many of you remember what was my dress code in 2019? What did I wear in 2019? Black suit. Okay, one. Hang on. Who else remembers what is unique between 2019 and 2022? where my dress sense was concerned. Come on, I'll give you a prize. 
Same? Same tie. Hang on, I won't tell you it's correct or wrong. Who else remembers? I need something better than that. I'll show you myself. I need a, I need a perfect, complete, sumptuous answer. Come on, quickly, before I count ten. Same? Same beard, thank you. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You said black suit. One of the days I wore a black suit, you said same tie. It's not only same tie, everything what you see here was exactly the same which I wore in Cube 2019, including the blazer, the tie, the cravat, the shirt, the trousers, not, and even the shoes, you'll be surprised, and even the shoes. So three years on, I'm the same weight, and I don't feel shy to wear the same clothes, because <laughs> this is cube. So give yourselves a big hand, and you please come here, doctor, and you please come here, because I'm going to give you a prize. May I invite Dr. Handy to kindly please uh, come and give you the prizes, please? Come on, on the stage, quickly. We are starting the session in one minute. Dr. Shainaz, please come up. Sir, what's your name? I was actually going to say the same. Dr. Shainaz gets the prize for remembering three years ago I wore the same tie. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you. And Dr. Amit Shah remembers that on one day I had worn a black blazer, which was absolutely right. Big round. Round of applause to both of you. Give him an extra. <laughs> I'll stay away from that. Thank you, Dr. Handu. Thank you. Okay. Hey, give me that. So we move on to our serious business sessions. I think we are 30 minutes late. So 4.30 to 4.45 p.m. It was supposed to be that. And now we're delayed for almost 55 minutes. Dr. Ar Arpan Mehta, are you here, Dr. Arpan Mehta? Yes. You are here. Head of Pathology Department, Slupatek, Newburgh, Ahmedabad, will speak on 2012 and 2021 ICSG guidelines for something I can't pronounce, an <laughs> FRC case study. Yes, so very good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you so much, Cube team, for considering me. Uh, so I shall be talking on quantification of cystocytes. Yes, so here is how I'll be going about it. So first we'll talk what are cystocytes, how do they look, how to count them, whether to call them or not call them, in which conditions do we see them, as well as an FRC parameter, which is a newer uh, uh, parameter, which is given by few hematology analyzers. So what are cystocytes? So the name is derived from Greek word cysto, meaning broken or cleft. And they are actually circulating fragments of red blood cells, or RBCs from which cytoplasmic fragments have been lost. And they are formed as a result of mechanical damage which happens to the membrane which is caused by fibrin strands on the endothelial surfaces and or by turbulence of blood. So this is just a short animation showing the same. So suppose this is a blood vessel and this is an RBC. It traverses through and fibrin strand tears it apart. So this is a similar thing on a different angle. So basically, how do they look? So long back there was a considerable confusion or rather lack of consensus as to which cells we should call as cystocytes. So 2012 recommendations were given up by ICSH. So they told how to identify cystocytes, in which conditions do they have value and how to count them. And now there is a recent update in 2021 uh, similar on the sides of 2012 recommendations. So according to ICSH, cystocytes are always smaller than red blood cells and should be defined as one of the four types. So the first variety is the smaller variety. 
So they are small fragments of varying shape, sometimes with sharp angles or spines, in which case we call them as triangular forms, with straight borders, or sometimes with round outline on one side, in which case we call them as microcrescents. Often distorted, usually staining darkly, and occasionally pale as a result of loss of hemoglobin. So here, what you look at is a microcrescent. The second variety is slightly la larger, so they are helmet cells, as we call them, which are damaged RBCs with one single or rarely a double amputated zone, highlighted by a straight border with sharp angulated edges, and the missing cell portion corresponds to fragments that are split off. So here is a helmet cell. Coming to third variety, so these are even larger cells, so these are damaged cells, larger, having a pair of spicules separated by a semicircular concave segment of membrane, sometimes even two or three pairs. So they are named as keratocytes or cells with horns. And they are formed as a rupture of one or more peripheral pseudovacuoles and subsequent fusion of cell membranes. So here is a keratocyte. Coming to la last type, these are small sized hyperdense RBCs with a round shape and increased staining. We all know them, they are microspherocytes and they are secondary manifestation of fragmentation. Now most important is they should be included only and only if we see other forms together. Then only we need to count them. So this is how they look. So this is a keratocyte. This is a helmet cell. This is a triangle cystocyte. These are microspherocytes. This is a helmet cell. This is a microspherocyte, this is a keratocyte, this is a microcrescent, and these are other cystocytes. Now, in which conditions we call them or not? So here, these are spherocytes, and we will not call them, since we are not seeing other types of cystocytes. These are irregularly contracted cells, and we will not call them. Again, these are acanthocytes, so we will not call them as cystocytes. These are sickle cells, and we will not call them as cystocytes. So this we need to differentiate from microcrescents, which are small in size, and these are larger than red blood cells. So these are a few other examples. So these we will call them as cystocytes, since they are helmet cells. These look like acanthocytes, and these are triangle forms. So we will count this, but not this. So these are, again, irregularly contracted cells and acanthocyte-like cells and this is a crescent, so we will count them. So we all know that it is possible only to count if we have a good smear. If you have, if your procedure is not good or the slide is not good, then we will not be able to identify that. So in 2021, again they have reiterated the fact that standard procedures for smearing and staining blood films is essential. And they have also, kept a point saying that these are stable only till three hours of blood collection at room temperature. And if you are keeping at four degrees, then they are stable. These findings are stable rather till four degree, till eight hours for at four degrees centigrade. Now, how do we count them? So first of all, we select an area where RBCs are just overlapping. Of course, that is the subtail region. We no, don't need to go towards the feathered edge where we see only spherocytes. So once we focus that, we go till in oil immersion, and then we count the number of RBCs and cystocytes. And then we put up in this formula, and we get the result. It is that simple. So recommendation is to count at least 1,000 cells. So this is a Rumke distribution table, which shows the confidence limits of an observed percentage of cystocytes, depending on the number of RBCs that we count. So if the true value is 1%, and if we count only 100 RBCs, then we can get a value anywhere between 0 to 5.4, which is a very wide range. So to increase the confidence limits, we count 1,000 red blood cells, where the limit narrows down, or the range rather narrows down. And if we want to even get a good, a better precision, then we need to count 10,000 red blood cells. So the recommendation is to count at least 1,000 red blood cells, and preferably 10,000. But is it easy to count 10,000? Well, the time needed for counting even 1,000 red blood cells is estimated to be on average 10 minutes. So the real-world application is difficult. So ICSH recommends a 1,000 cell count as a best balance between the precision required versus the time and resources that we have. So this is just 
practically how we can count. So this is just a field which we have shown. Of course, we need to select a field where RBC is just overlapping and not as sparse as this. Just, just uh, this is just for demonstration purpose. So we can have an imaginary lines like this and start counting red blood cells in one and multiply it by four. And if you want a better precision, then we need to count in all four. And thus, we can get average number of red blood cells in one field. Important thing to note here is we need to select in whichever fields we are going to go. We need to have an idea that we are going to get or we are going to see RBCs, means fields with RBCs, which are similar. So in similar in number. So we cannot go with such sparse fields and then dense fields like that. So once we have an average number of red blood cells, we start counting the cystocytes. And we count the number of cystocytes and then the number of fields in which we have counted those cystocytes. So we have three values and we put and we get the result. So it is said that an average field would have about 200 red blood cells if it is a well-made blood field. And if you select an average area, it will have 200. So if we want to count 10,000, we need to select 50 fields count the number of cystocytes, and usually it takes roughly 8 to 10 minutes, and you are done. So this is the distribution of type of cystocytes. So as you can see, helmets, crescents, and microcrescents are the predominant forms of cystocytes, while triangle forms, keratocytes, and microspherocytes are the less predominant forms. As you can see, cystocytes are not only seen in microangiopathic hemolytic anemias, but they are also seen in hematological malignancies, even megaloblastic anemias. You can see in carcinomas, renal failures, infections, etc. So important thing to note here is that even these conditions can have thrombocytopenias. So the presence of cystocytes, even if associated with severe thrombocytopenia, may not specifically identify cases of thrombotic microangiopathy. So you need to see the clinical context, as well as you need to see whether cystocyte is the predominant abnormality. And even conversely, lack of cystocytosis does not exclude the diagnosis of thrombotic microangiopathy, in which case, if you still have clinical suspicion, we need to examine the films daily, because there are case reports in which there, are, there is absence of cystocytosis, even if that is a case of thrombotic microangiopathy. Like this is the case of megaloblastic anemia, and you are seeing a lot of cystocytes here and there. But that is not the predominant abnormality. Predominant abnormality here are micro, macrovellocytes, hypersegmented neutrophil, Howell jolly bodies. So this is a case of megaloblastic anemia. So we need to uh, report these qualitatively. So these are the upper limits which were given in 2012 recommendations. So in healthy adults, it is like till 0.2% you can see. In neonates, you see higher. It is 1.9%. And even in premature neonates, you see till 5.5%. So cutoff is defined only for two clinically significant conditions, and that is thrombotic microangiopathy, which is capped at 1%, and transplant-associated thrombotic microangiopathy, which is capped at about 4%. In other cases, whenever you see cystocyte as not the predominant abnormality, it should be graded qualitatively and mentioned in the final report that it is not the predominant abnormality. These are the recommendations. In 2021, they have kept two things as healthy adults and full-term neonates at 1%, which was similar to before, and premature babies at 5%. And whenever you are grading qualitatively, you can follow 2015 recommendations, in which it is 1 plus when less than 1%, 2 plus 1 to 2%, and 3 plus at more than 2%. So this is a blonde and Altman plot, which is showing inter-observer differences uh, between two observers. And you can see there is a good overall agreement uh, at lower cystocyte percentages between two observers. So this is an approach which is given in 2021 recommendations. So whenever you have a clinical suspicion of thrombotic microangiopathy, or you have a positive FRC, which I'll be talking about, then you need to see the blood film and see whether cystocytes are present or not. If they are present, we need to see whether they are. it is the predominant abnormality. If it is not, and still you have strong clinical suspicion, like I told before, we need to examine daily. If not, then we need to think about other diagnosis. If it is the predominant abnormality, then like I showed, we count about 1,000 red blood cells and determine if it falls below the cutoff, then it is unlikely thrombotic microangiopathy, and if else, it is TMA. Coming to automation, the FRC percentage as well as absolute count, which is given by few automated hematology analyzers, it has advantages in that it is 
having good reproducibility in contrast to manual counts where you can have some differences. Here approximately 30,000 red blood cells are counted as compared to manual which, in which we count pretty less. They are available within minutes. You run them and you get the result. It does not require morphology evaluation by an expert pathologist. It has good sensitivity and negative predictive value. However, it comes with limitations in that it overestimates as well as underestimates. It is affected by hypochromia. It has very low specificity and it is not recommended to be used only in isolation. So this is one of the hematology analyzers. Here, it, it is dependent on integrated analysis of erythrocytes and platelets, where FRC corresponds to refractive index more than 1.4 and uh, volume less than 30 femtoliters. This is the second hematology analyzer. This is uh, Sysmex. So here, on x-axis, you can see RNA content. In y-axis, you can see the forward scatter, where these are the mature red blood cells having higher forward scatter, and these are platelets with lower forward scatter. So you determine a gate here, and then that is here. So this separates RBCs from platelets. And then there is a gate here with lower forward scatter and lower fluorescence. So this determines, uh, if you take this percentage with respect to all red blood cells, you will get the cystocyte percentage. In addition to this, there is another gate here, which is, uh, which is called as microerythrocyte distribution area, in which microcytic red blood cells fall. So if it is above a certain limit, it will autocorrect. So these are the reference ranges given for FRCs. So predominantly studies are done on Sysmex and Advia. And it is found that means or medians fall between 0.2 to 0.4. And we call abnormal result when we get more than 0.5 percentage. So this is again, uh, it has a very low specificity. So that means it will give higher false positives. But as you can see, it gives very good sensitivity and very good negative predictive value, meaning thereby that if you have lower automated FRC counts, that means there is very less possibility that there are cystocytes in the blood film. So this is just a case I made up yesterday. So this was a 12 years female with a suspected case of HUS that we had got. So we followed it up for like 9 to 10 days and we saw cystocytes decreasing from 12.3% to 1.95% and likewise FRC and FRC, FRC percentage and absolute counts decreasing proportionately. Likewise, NRBC is disappearing after some time of plasma phoresis. So as you can see, there is a very good trend line which are developing. So based on all the findings and papers and all, 2021 recommendations gave evidence-based statements for FRC. And they told that FRC results and flags are a helpful screening test and not confirmatory test. The absence of FRC is a valuable parameter to exclude cystocytes. But when MCV is high, it can give false negative. Multi-center studies are required to generate a reference range. And samples with positive FRC count should be reviewed by optical microscopy. So a cystocyte count has definite clinical value in TMA in absence of additional severe red cell shape abnormalities with a confident threshold value of 1%. And automated counting of RBC fragments is also recommended by ICSH, ICSH working group as a complement to the microscope according to the high predictive value of negative results. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arpan. Any questions for Dr. Arpan? There are some online questions, Dr. Arpan. In which clinical condition schistocytes are significant specifically? Okay, so uh, like I told you, uh, in basically in two conditions. One is thrombotic microangiopathy in which we can see TTP or HUS, so thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and hemolytic uremic syndrome. And another one is TA, transplant associated thrombotic microangiopathy, in which case we keep thresholds at 4% and in thrombotic microangiopathies isolated, we keep at 1%.
I think, Nikhil, are there any more questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Arpan. Thank you very much. May I call upon stage Dr. Shanaz Khodai ji to chair the sessions ahead? Before I begin, I'd like to thank everyone at Mindray for inviting me to chair this uh, forthcoming session. And it's uh, particularly my pleasure to chair this session because the two people I know very well and interact with are going to be speaking. First is Pradeep Suri. So, uh, the first speaker is Dr. Pradeep Suri, who is director of Dr. Suri Labs Private Limited in New Delhi. He manages a standalone lab of very high quality. We've known that because time and again he keeps researching all the parameters and presenting them to us, and we learn a lot from him always. It's a high quality diagnostic laboratory with technical details and quality management. Uh, over to you, Thank you. Dr. Pradeep Suri. <coughs> At the outside, I'd like to thank the Mindre team and Dr. Anil Handu for uh, giving me this opportunity. The topic that I'm going to speak today is hematological markers in COVID-19 and sepsis. I would like to start with a disclaimer that, you know, talking about both the topics in 10 minutes is a little difficult, but I'll try to cover as many salient points as possible. So basically, uh, we did this study in the first wave of COVID itself, where there are a host of inflammatory markers that we were studying. And we wanted to look whether there are some hematological markers which could correlate these pro-inflammatory markers. So the first marker was CRP, which was the most potent marker to look for, you know, severity or aggravation of severe and moderate COVID. And usually an average of 20 to 50 mg per liter had a good correlation of progressing to moderate to severe COVID. So this is one of the parameters that we studied along with the hematological markers. The next acute phase reactant that we studied was ferritin. Ferritin is not only an acute phase reactant, but is also involved in iron metabolism. And it had a significant prognostic role to determine, especially serially rising ferritin levels of doubling in less than 12 to 24 hours had a direct correlation with COVID storm. Then we also looked at interleukin-6 or IL-6, which is a potential predictor of detecting COVID storm at a value of 10x over the normal range. And at a cutoff of 24 pg per ml, it showed an initial excellent assessment for progression to moderate to severe disease. We also looked at lactate dehydrogenase. This is an important marker. It has got a six-fold increase odds of developing severe disease at a high level and had a 16-fold increase in odds of mortality in severe COVID disease. So LDH was the single most important marker in predicting mortality in COVID patients. And last but not the least, we also correlated with D-dimer, which was also, apart from being a pro-inflammatory marker, was also a pro-coagulant marker. And its meaningful prognosis was at a cutoff of 2 mg per liter. Sorry. So the objective of our study was twofold. A, to establish correlation between hematological parameters and the inflammatory markers. And B, to try to establish the most useful hematological parameters that could be used for COVID-19 prognosis. So the materials that we used here were, we did the CRP and LDH using Cobas Integra, ferritin using Abbott Architect chemiluminescent system, interleukin-6 using the Beckman axis. This point is not working. Okay. D-dimer using the VIDAS, RT-PCR using Biorad CFX96 amplification system and ZBO extraction. And last but not the least, CBC with retic count using Mindre BC 6800 plus. So what we adopted was a simple four-step methodology. In step one, patients who were RT-PCR positive for COVID-19 were selected in the scope of study. In step two, we only took patients who had got both CBC and the five inflammatory markers done. All the other patients were excluded from the study. Step three, we also asked for the history of corticosteroid intake and the group was further filtered 
to include those patients who had not taken steroid because steroid itself leads to neutrophilic leukocytosis which shift to left and we did not want to you know uh, uh, bias our uh, study with the effect of corticosteroid and then we performed the CBC parameters for all these patients and did an unpaired t-test against each of these inflammatory markers and divided them into two groups low inflammatory marker and high inflammatory marker so do you have a pointer yeah thanks so the first group is crp we divided into two groups crp less than 20 and crp more than 20 and the parameters that we studied were absolute lymphocyte count absolute neutrophil count rdw both cv and sd immature platelet fraction newt y neutrophil lymphocyte ratio immature granulocytes hfc immature reticulocyte fraction and mono z so as you can see the three parameters that stood out were absolute lymphocyte count absolute neutrophil count and neutrophil lymphocyte ratio the mean values in crp less than 20 were 1.9 and 1.2 respectively for alc 5.4 and 6.3 for anc and 3.7 and 7.2 for nlr so these were the three important hematological parameters which correlated well with the crp next coming to ferritin again we divided into two groups ferritin less than 300 ferritin more than 300 again two of the markers are common absolute lymphocyte count 1.8 and 1.3 neutrophil lymphocyte ratio 4 and 6.7 pretty similar to crp however an interesting finding was that the hfc was increased in group where ferritin was more than 300 ferritin is an interesting marker it is not only pro inflammatory it is also an anti inflammatory marker so sometime rising ferritin also gave uh, you know knowledge about patient recovery also apart from the fact that high ferritin could also cause cytokine storm so it, it is a double edged sword next we did ldh again pretty similar to crp they were absolute lymphocyte count absolute neutrophil count and nlr were the three parameters where there was a significant difference at a cutoff of 350 next il6 again absolute lymphocyte count and nlr were the two markers which were showing significant difference and hfc like ferritin also showed significant difference at an ilc less, less than 24 and more than 24 so pretty much in all these four uh, inflammatory markers anc alc hfc and nlr were the four uh, hematological parameters that were most useful however d dimer springed up a surprise so in d dimer there was not much difference between the two groups d dimer less than one and more than one barring immature reticulocyte fraction which showed a significant difference in d dimer less than one it was 10.8 and in d dimer more than one it was 16.5 however we do, don't know the reason for it so next we did a t test and as you can see the p value for crp versus nlr was extremely significant and the mean value for crp greater than 20 was 7.25 and less than 20 was 3.77 so around a cutoff of around 4 nlr you could differentiate mild from moderate to severe covid disease next crp versus absolute lymphocyte count again the p value was extremely significant and uh, the mean value for CRP less than 20 was 1.76 and 1.22 for more than 20. Again, CRP versus absolute neutrophil count again extremely significant. Ferritin versus absolute lymphocyte count, the p-value was again extremely significant. Ferritin versus HFC, the p-value was again extremely significant. Ferritin versus NLR again extremely significant interleukin 6 versus absolute lymphocyte count again extremely significant il6 versus neutrophil lymphocyte uh, nlr it was not as significant as crp but still it was significant il6 versus hfc again extremely significant d dimer versus immature reticulocyte fraction p value was extremely significant and the mean value 
in the dimer less than 1 was 10.8 and in more than 1 was 16.48 clearly the irf values were higher in patients with dimer more than 1 crp versus hfc it was mildly significant not that significant but an interesting observation all patients in whom hfc percentage was more than 1% all of them showed uh, you know some amount of recovery from uh, symptoms of covid within 48 hours so an hfc more than 1% is actually a good prognostic marker for covid crp versus newt y again mildly significant so newt y did not show a very good significance in both uh, crp less than 20 and more than 20 ferritin versus absolute neutrophil count again mildly significant so the conclusion of our study was that absolute lymphocyte count absolute neutrophil count nlr and hfc were the best prognostic markers and they showed excellent correlation for most of the inflammatory markers barring the d-dimer nlr was the most efficacious marker amongst them all the various parameter analyzed and at a cutoff of four there was a uh, robust sensitivity and specificity to different mild COVID from moderate to severe COVID. Immature reticulocyte fraction showed excellent correlation with D-dimer, but not other inflammatory markers. This could be a topic for further research. Next, this is our paper predicting developing sepsis, which we presented at ISLH. Uh, Melbourne, but this is a paper which predates the COVID paper because that time COVID was nowhere in the window. So what we did here was the object of this study was to evaluate novel hematological parameters like newt y, mono z, nlr and img and to try and see if any of them could differentiate bacteremia from septicemia and also to assess if any of these markers could predict severity of sepsis or it could be used a marker in treatment or prognosis similar to procalcitonin. So again the material that we used were we did the procalcitonin using Mindre CL 96i, the hematological parameters using Mindre BC 6800 plus and blood culture using Bactlert from Biomerio. So what we adopted was again a four step methodology. All the blood samples normal range was established for all the these novel parameters newt y mono z img and nlr and then all patients of pyrexia who who had given both cbc and blood culture were included in the study and only those patients were taken who had at least two diagnostic criteria for, from the surviving sepsis guidelines all patients who were blood culture negative were further excluded from the study and at this stage we had 70 samples and we calculated the Uden index and the ROC curve to see the cutoff where you could maximize the specificity and sensitivity of each of the variable. So this is the Uden's index. The two parameters which showed the best results were newt y. In newt y, the cutoff between bacteremia and septicemia was 492 and it had showed robust sensitivity and specificity. And for NLR, the cutoff was 10.66 and again it showed good sensitivity and specificity. So coming to diagnostic sensitivity and specificity, the diagnostic sensitivity of newt y was 100 and specificity was 93% whereas the diagnostic sensitivity of NLR was 86% and specificity was 100%. So we can say that the newt y was the most sensitive markers in differentiating bacteremia from septicemia whereas NLR was the most specific marker. So although both of them were promising markers for early sepsis, but none of them could predict the severity of sepsis, which means that as the sepsis became more severe, it was not like the, uh, the newt Y or the NLR was increasing multifold like a procalcitonin. So it, it was not a substitute for procalcitonin to predict the severity of sepsis. One more thing I would like to say that although NLR is increased in both COVID and uh, sepsis, but the mechanism is very different. In COVID, NLR is primarily increasing because of lymphopenia and the resulting relative neutrophilia. Whereas in sepsis, 
the nlr is primarily increasing because of neutrophilic leukocytosis which shift to left that is one of the reasons why newt y is showing good sensitivity and specificity in sepsis but is not showing that good sensitivity and specificity for covid so with these words i'd like to thank you all if there are any questions i'll be glad to answer Ah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Suri, for that very uh, wonderful and lucid talk. And really, you have studied so many parameters, very useful. And I can see one hand up for the first time. I'm so happy someone's asking a question. Hello, I'm Dr. Ruchi. I'm the consultant hematologist in Toprani Lab, Baroda. Actually, I just want to add on one more point to this. One of the very earliest marker in COVID-19. That is eosinopenia. Yes. Uh, that is very, very common at this very early phase uh, that eosinopenia develops. When the absolute value count is less than 20, we should suspect uh, sepsis or a COVID-19. In uh, COVID, this last two years, we were like, uh, we got samples from two COVID centers to our lab. And each and every patient, they had zero count of eosinophils. So that was the uh, major draw. Uh, malab, uh, we saw that in many patients and uh, it was a case like in our lab also somebody does CBC from our staff and that is eosinopenia that means he should or she should go to the like home uh, it is like a very early marker and it should be included uh, yeah, I agree yeah that's right eosinopenia is a very age old marker for uh, sepsis but uh, have you Validated it and have you found the significance? Yeah, I've and got a few it? articles related because to it. Because mostly it's anecdotal. People do notice and it is noticeable, yeah. but one needs to uh, work it up and, and yeah. establish a significance basically. But it's a helpful clinical marker, no doubt. Yes, Madam Mamta Soni. Actually, eosinopenia, we conducted a study in our hospital, uh, some 650 cases, and we got very, very promising results. Eosinopenia is definitely an early predictive marker for COVID-19, as she rightly said, and it also helps to kind of, you know, quarantine those people, segregate those people till you get final confirmatory result from RT-PCR lab. And this paper has been published in IJLH. So, yes, it has been objectively validated. Other than eosinopenia, also RDW. Red cell distribution with also the same paper, I think I took a study on some 700 samples, patient samples, that is also published as a letter to editor in IJLH. And it is a promising prognostic indicator for COVID-19 infection. So these two, and of course D-dimer, D-dimer also we, we published the study in uh, diabetic and uh, nephropathic uh, journal because it was very, very uh, kind of predictive, in, especially in diabetic patients. And we got similar results like Dr. Suri, you know, more than two uh, is kind of a predictor for a negative prognosis. I mean, these patients don't do all that well. So yes, eosinopenia, right, Dr. Ruchi, and we took up a study, and it, it's like one of the very high, highly cited papers. Yes, you published. So I think the world is looking at eosinopenia and RDW, and very, very helpful in resource-limited setting like India, where immediately we can't kind of get an RT-PCR done. Just on a simple CBC, we can at least segregate those patients before we take up the further work. True, true. Thank very you. True. Yes. We read your paper also. Dr. Ruma. <laughs> Yeah, further to eosinopenia, neonatal sepsis. Absolutely, I depend on eosinophils. If eosinopenia and you have the banned cells, please, that baby is septic, definitely. And there are certain permutation combinations we have all worked out, less than five days and more than five days. But eosinopenia is one thing which has to be there before you call it a septic baby also. So besides COVID, you have other conditions and especially neonates. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Dr. Suri, your uh, talk has generated a lot of questions. Sir, and a lot of I'll just, uh, Anybody else? Dr. Mishra. I must compliment him for this excellent study during the COVID period. Nothing else was happening. So I just have one suggestion that you have uh, done bivariate analysis. 
Why don't you do a multivariate analysis of all the variables? Pardon, sir, come again, sir. I said you have hmm. mostly done bivariate analysis, saying one is superior to the other in terms of identifying something, sepsis or no sepsis. So why don't you do a multivariate analysis of your different parameters? You're talking about the sepsis studies or the COVID studies? Like come COVID up with some algorithm between Co COVID all studies, these parameters. Because you see, whenever you, you uh, in the second study, you showed your objective. The objective was very nice. In the first study, you have multiple parameters and you have just compared two, two parameters at one time. No, no, sir, we compared everything. We, we are only showing you the ones that were significant. No, I understand, but, the, you, but you haven't done a multivariate analysis of the different parameters. No, no, sir, I am not comparing uh, an inflammatory marker to another inflammatory marker. I am comparing the inflammatory marker to the hematological markers. So we've done a plethora of hematological markers. That, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. So you are trying to show the significance between two markers and you are calculating the p-value between, between two parameters between at one time. Yes, sir. So if you do a multivariate and multivariate analysis or the statistical strength of multivariate analysis is far superior to bivariate analysis. Okay. So since you have studied so many parameters, why don't you do a multivariate analysis and see ki which are the two markers which are significant and those are the two you recommend to be done. There may be a third or a fourth marker which may be beneficial, but in the multivariate analysis they may be losing out. But between two parameters, one may be superior to the other. Okay, so we'll apply another statistical tools. Also, maybe all the most significant parameters can be taken together and a kind of algorithm derived, you know, like one figure can be calculated, so it becomes easier. No, no, we, we have calculated cutoff points huh. for Every, everything. For everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But so, also there is a way in which you can uh, probably take all the parameters and do some kind of st statistical studies, the most significant parameters, and come up with some statistical calculation, which if you, you know, which you can see above this is positive is sepsis, but in a, it's more specific because you're taking so many parameters into right. consideration. I mean, wonderful work done, yeah, so it right. can culminate in that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if time permits, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, pr nice presentation, Dr. Suri. Actually, uh, it's about COVID-19 and, you know, the parameters which you have discussed. So, uh, I would like to know what is your experience about D-dimer? Because many a times the patient recover from the disease and clinically they are fine. But it is the investigation D-dimer results which keep on bothering them and it takes a lot of time in coming down. And to my experience, like what I have realized, there's a lot of variation from, you know, place to place. Like a sample goes to uh, one lab and then goes to another lab and there is a lot of variation and it also depends upon the instrument. Right. So would you like to comment on like what could be the factors which are affecting and the patient is more worried about D-dimer rather than, you know, being about clinical symptoms? So two things, uh, D-dimer can of course be elevated for sometimes more than a month after the patient recovers, that is a known phenomenon. But more importantly, there is a large amount of variation in the D-dimer across labs primarily for two reasons. The major challenge in India is actually a pre-analytic challenge because you know the coagulation, you need to take the sample, separate the plasma within two hours, run it or freeze it. But the way this B2B industry runs, you know, sample taken at 9 o'clock in the morning reaches the main lab at 6.37 in the evening, by that time the D-dimer val values will automatically be elevated. I can give you anecdotal evidence of my own cousin who in Gurgaon got from a B2B lab, all their family got elevated D-dimer. I asked them to go to Medanta next day, give the sample. Everybody's sample was normal. So this is one part of the story. The other part of the story is D-dimer unfortunately is available across multiple technologies. You can do a D-dimer as an immunoturbidometry. Yes. You can do D-dimer as an alpha. You can do D-dimer through coagulation analyzer as well. Now, all three technologies are totally different. So, if I run the same D-dimer sample across all three platforms, even within my own lab, I will get three different values. So, without saying which is right, which is wrong, the point is, if you are first D-dimer value is on immunoturbidometry, then you pursue it on an immunoturbidometric platform or 
vice versa if you want to do on alpha then continue doing it on the alpha platform yes it is the second point which actually we experienced and we realized the methodology makes lot of difference yes. if there is no pre analytical issue no no so so point. so we we ran uh, uh, d dimer samples of more than 20 30 patients across all three platforms and the variation was something like between 200 to 300% across platforms so it's 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 like you know one day you go for alpha next day you go for immunoturbidometry third day you go for coagulation your d dimer will be all over the place right agreed yeah. thank you thank, thank you we we'll end there thank you thank you pradeep for a very good talk and uh, i will uh, invite uh, dr anuradha sekaran who's director and chief pathologist aig hospitals hyderabad to give her talk on malignant cells identification in body fluids by the bc620 so uh, as we all know that detection of malignant cells in the body fluids is very important for um, the correct clinical treatment and diagnosis and for staging of cancers and uh, most of the time the patient suddenly comes to us with only pleural or ascitic fluid so the cytology evaluation is very important but as we are all aware we require a very professional and expert cytopathologist to make a diagnosis so sometimes when you don't have a cytopathologist at site they might be delay in um, sampling so this is where i thought that uh, uh, evaluation by the uh, by the hematology analyzers can um, actually cut down this uh, gap between the cytology and the hematology and uh, the screening by the hematology machines is a, a very rapid method and a good adjunct to the gold standard cytopathology so most of these new um, five part and seven part analyzers have also the new detection mode that is the body fluid analyzer where they are using the flow cytometry enabled the high fluorescence body fluid mode which is useful to discriminate between the malignant cells and the uh, non malignant cells the scatter plot analysis of the instrument actually it has three types the forward scatter side scatter and the light fluorescent so uh, the forward scatter usually works on the size of the cells the side scatter as you are aware works on the nuclear details and the light and the lateral um, uh, fluorescence uh, method helps to distinguish between these malignant and non malignant cells the most important part is the fluorescent intensity and the side scatter is higher for the tumor cells when compared to the mesothelial cells because the tumor cells have more nucleic acid when compared to the mesothelial and the wbcs so probably this is the um, main point on which the anal analysis um, the analyzers are able to uh, separate the mesothelial and the tumor cells also these cells tumor cells tend to aggregate more and they have high fluorescence and side scatter so this is what i wanted to say that um, the side scatter uh, is based on the uh, nuclear details the forward scatter is based on the size and the fluorescent uh, lateral fluorescence these are the three components which are being used so this um, is a study which we just did in one month that is june 2022 at asian institute of gastroenterology's uh, main branch aig hospitals at hyderabad the body fluids were received to the lab in uh, k2 edta tubes as well as in sterile containers we strongly recommend our clinicians to send whatever fluid they have aspirated whether it is 10 ml or 1 liter so we get uh, ranges from 10 ml to almost 1 to 1.5 liter an automated analysis and the slide presentation uh, slide preparation were done within 2 hours uh, of receival of the lab during this one month period we have analyzed 147 serous fluids which comprised of ascitic and pleural fluids on the mindrai bc 6200 uh, body fluid mode and uh, all the samples were also microscopically screened uh, on the cytospin slides with hnd mgg and pap and um, the malignant cells on cytospin uh, slides were um, defined as those which were greater or equal to category 3 uh, according to the iac guidelines so uh, this was a small study which we did only in the month of june uh, where i considered only 147 fluids and we had four um, uh, fluids which were positive on the analyzer so i would just like to go into details of those four cases the case one is a 75 year old female who had uh, presented with a sense of breathlessness and loss of weight and had a left massive pleural effusion around 400 ml of blood tinged uh, hazy pleural fluid was received for uh, analysis Uh, so if you see in the um, analyzer as we have already discussed uh, we are going to analyze the total nucleated cells 
the WBC cells and uh, the uh, high fluorescence body fluid and uh, body fluid component which showed around 62 cells and uh, in the manual uh, microscopy um, few atypical cells interspersed with reactive mesothelial cell clusters was noted. Uh, cytology was moderately cellular and it was categorized as um, category 3 atypical cells. So if you see this uh, analyzer, here you have an area where there is a mixture of your uh, high fluorescent cells and the mononucleum polymorphonuclear cells. So when you mask all these cells, so th these are the 62 percentage of the cells which are falling in that bracket. So um, So this was a cytosmear which showed a very cellular smear and uh, we had lot of uh, reactive and uh, uh, mesothelial cells and some atypical cells. So probably sometimes on our cytosmears we, um, we are not very definitive to categorize it as malignant. So usually we take a cell block as a golden standard and um, again here a good uh, cell block evaluation and a good um, cytosmears will depend on uh, how much of fluid and how good we mix it and how good we process it, when, particularly when you receive more than 100 ml. So usually in our uh, institute, we make it as a standard to at least um, for every uh, 50 ml to try to make one cell block. So sometimes if you get one liter, we end up making as many as 8 to 10 uh, cell blocks to improve the yield. So this was a fairly cellular cell block and you can see that um, there is a SNR pattern of arrangement and as we had already talked about the nuclear features, uh, you have high NC ratio, clumped chromatin, uh, this will go in favor of a uh, malignant uh, effusion. So this was positive for atypical cells and even the instrument had picked up these atypical cells. The second case is a 37 year old male uh, who on triphasic CT was cirrhotic. There was splenomegaly, mild to moderate ascites, AFP was normal and we received only 30 ml of uh, yellowish hazy uh, ascetic fluid. So if you see here again, you have, um, this is your uh, area where you have the clustering of the cells but when, when you try to see, uh, we had almost as few as only three cells. So we had taken a cutoff of um, high fluorescent uh, cells of around 22. But here even with three cells, uh, we are able to find that they are atypical cells. On the manual microscopy, they were predominantly mesothelial cells. But on cytology, there were few atypical cells. But probably it was false positive on cytology because cell block proved that they were reactive mesothelial cells. So this is the cytospin showing the uh, reactive uh, mesothelial proliferation and uh, this the cell block which showed only mesothelial cells probably on cytospin these were the cells which we thought initially as malignant but the cell block and IHC proved it as benign. This is a third case of 42 year old male who had SOB, fever, multiple liver abscess uh, and CT also showed hepatic abscess.